Previously, we introduced the concept of the active site and we said that all the different types of enzymes found inside our body and inside our cells have active sites. So it turns out that just like all enzymes have similar properties, the active sites of enzymes also have important similar properties. And this is what we're going to focus on in this lecture. We're going to discuss the six major properties of active sites. And let's begin with property number one. The active site, it's that location, it's the three-dimensional region found on that enzyme that is responsible for actually binding onto that substrate. So inside the active site, so if this is our enzyme, this is our active site. This three-dimensional crevice, the three-dimensional crack in that enzyme is the active site. And this active site consists of the residues, those amino acids, that are responsible for binding onto the substrate. And not only that, inside the active site we also have these catalytic groups, these residues part of the enzyme that are responsible for actually catalyzing that particular reaction. And this leads us directly into property number two. Active sites are responsible for stabilizing the transition state as well as forming and breaking the particular bonds involved in that chemical biological reaction. So inside the active site we have those residues responsible for actually stabilizing and lowering the energy of the transition state and this is precisely what speeds up that particular reaction. In addition we have those catalytic groups that are responsible for stimulating the breaking of bonds and the forming of bonds. Now property number three active sites create a micro environment. So if we look in the following uh, diagram we have this active site and what the active site does is when it actually binds onto that substrate it essentially closes off ever so slightly and it creates this micro environment that is predominantly nonpolar. In fact the only time we're going to find water molecules inside the active site is when the water molecule is actually a participant, a reactant, in that particular chemical reaction. Otherwise, we'll never find the water molecules inside the active site. And that means the environment in the active site is nonpolar. Now, what this microenvironment does is, it brings the reactants very close together and it orients them in just the right orientation for that specific reaction to actually take place. And what it also does is it decreases the likelihood that other reactions take place and that decreases the likelihood that unwanted products are actually formed. So active sites typically create nonpolar microenvironments in which bonds can be formed and broken very easily. And unless water actually participates as a reactant in that biological reaction, it is usually excluded from that microenvironment, from that active site. And this also helps prevent unwanted reactions. Now, property number four of active sites. Active sites actually only make up a very small portion, a very small component of that overall enzyme. So even though the enzyme is usually relatively large, that active site is actually quite small compared to the overall structure and size of that particular enzyme. The question is why? Well, if we examine the residues involved in the active site, those residues are usually found very far away apart from one another on that primary sequence of the polypeptide chain. And what that means is to bring those residues close together, that entire enzyme has to fold and form this particular three-dimensional shape. And to fold and bring those residues that are far apart close together, we have to fold in different ways and many times to basically form the active site. So it turns out the entire enzyme basically creates a scaffolding system that supports and stabilizes that small section, the active site, that is actually used by the enzyme to catalyze that particular chemical reaction. So the active site is much smaller 
smaller than the actual size of the enzyme. So the remaining portion of the enzyme acts to create, stabilize and support the active site by bringing the residues that are far apart closer together to basically catalyze the reaction and bind the substrate. Now, in addition, we can have other sites on the enzyme outside of the active site that also play an important role in actually regulating the functionality of that particular enzyme. And these other sites are known as allosteric sites, and we'll see many examples in the next several lectures or in future lectures. Now, on top of that, these other portions of the enzyme can also interact with different types of components found in the cell. For example, we have a variety of different types of proteins and enzymes found in a cell membrane that actually bind onto that cell membrane. And so these other sections of the enzyme can be responsible for actually adhering and binding onto the cell machinery, for example, the membrane of the cell. Now, property number five of, enzy of enzymes and the active sites of enzymes is that active sites typically bind substrates reversibly via non-covalent forces. So, in property number one and two, we basically mentioned that inside the active site, we have these special residues, the amino acids that contain the special side chain groups that are responsible for actually attaching and binding the substrate molecules. And the binding that, uh, and the binding that takes place takes place via non-covalent interactions such as hydrogen bonds, such as hydrophobic interactions, and van der Waals forces. So non-covalent electric forces such as hydrogen bonds, van der Waals forces, and the hydrophobic effect can all promote the reversible binding between the active side and the substrate. And what reversible binding basically means is once the substrate binds onto that active side and once we convert the substrate into the product, that product will essentially release itself and move away from the active site. It will not remain bound to that active site forever. That's what we mean by reversible binding. Now, and this leads us directly into property six. So recall from our discussion on non-covalent interactions, we said that for non-covalent interactions to actually be strong enough and to actually be meaningful, the distance between our bonds, the distance between the molecules and atoms forming the bonds actually has to be short enough. And so what that means is, in order for the substrate to actually get close to the active side, to get close enough to form those meaningful non-covalent bonds, the shape of that substrate has to be complementary to that shape of the active site of the enzyme. And that leads us to property six. Active site, active sites, this should be active sites. Where is my marker? Um, so this should be active sites have structures complementary to their corresponding substrate. So in order for the non-covalent interactions between the residues of the active site of the enzyme and the substrate to be meaningful and strong enough for them to actually remain attached, the distance between them must be short enough. And this implies that the substrate must fit, must, must fit snugly into the active site of that particular enzyme. Enzyme, and this leads us into these two models. So these two models are generally used to basically describe the way that the binding between the substrate and the active side of the enzyme actually takes place. And although we still use the lock and key model, it's really the induced fit model that describes more correctly the way that our binding takes place. So let's begin by discussing what we mean by the lock and key model. So lock and key simply means we have a key, we have a lock, and essentially when we place the key into the lock, we know that the shapes are complementary, and that's why we have a perfect fit between our lock and between our key. So in the lock and key model, the substrate fits precisely and perfectly into the active side to, due to their complementary shape. So 
even before they actually bind, what this model tells us is the active site of the enzyme, so the green structure is the enzyme, this is the active site, and this is the substrate. And notice that before the binding actually takes place, this is complementary in structure to this active site. And so when they fit, this simply moves into the active site, and then they form those non-covalent interactions. Now, according to our induced fit model, the active side of that enzyme is not exactly complementary to our uh, substrate. But when the binding actually takes place, the enzyme actually conforms to the structure of that substrate. And so the enzyme's active side basically changes shape ever so slightly. It induces the shape and then once the binding takes place, the active side basically conforms and takes the complementary shape of that particular substrate molecule. So in the induced fit model, the shape of the enzyme's active site is not exactly complementary. However, upon binding of the substrate to the active site, the binding causes the active site to become complementary to that substrate. So what the induced fit model basically tells tells us is when the binding takes place, the active site of that enzyme and the, and the substrate itself actually change shape ever so slightly and they both conform into the shape in which each one is complementary to the other. So the substrate becomes complementary to the active site and the active site becomes complementary to that particular substrate. And it's, th and it's this induced fit model that actually describes correctly the way that the binding actually takes place between the active side of the enzyme and the substrate.